Okay, <clears throat> Michael de Klerk. So I have two, two presentations and they are both imperfect and they are both a little bit shorter than they should have been. And I apologize, but uh, I, I think you'll, uh, you'll uh, agree with me that uh, he was a very interesting uh, and talented uh, architect uh, who unfortunately you see he died at 39 and uh, that's really uh, a short life. Uh, maybe especially for architects because architects live usually long, longer lives. Anyway, um, so Michael de Klerk, uh, this is a little picture. Uh, I have other pictures with him, but um, this one appears on, on Wikipedia. He is obviously he's almost like a teenager here. Anyway, he looks very young. And uh, we read Michael de Klerk. So he was born on the 24th of November in 1884. Uh, was a Dutch architect born to a Jewish family. He was one of the founding architects of the movement Amsterdam School Expressionist Architecture. Early in his career, he worked for other architects, including Edward Kuipers. Uh, for a while, he was also employed uh, by the Indonesian born, uh, you know, this architect who would later become his country's pioneering prom proponent of the Amsterdam School and modern architecture. Actually, I didn't know this uh, and uh, I'm thinking now to make a presentation on this architect too, particularly since we have some friends in Indonesia. So of his many outstanding designs, very few have actually been built. One of his finest completed buildings is the ship in the Amsterdam, so-called the ship in the Amsterdam district of, <laughs> I will let you read this, uh, this word. Okay, so now I will begin actually in a way upside down. Uh, um, I, will, I will begin with showing some uh, uh, graphic works that he did for, um, uh, a magazine or a, a book, a collection of books where his projects and drawings have been published. And he did uh, three covers of this magazine, which were designed by, by the clerk. This is one of them. And you see, uh, it's all already very different from uh, the graphics of the Stiel or, or the Bauhaus. Uh, you know, here there are uh, historical references but also some kind of uh, ethnic references. It's a, it's a, it is a cultural reference to other cultures. You know, the masks on the left and the Sphinx or whatever it is there. So, you know, we are already in a different field than, than uh, the modernism, the orthodox modernism of the Stiel and, uh, and, uh, and the Bauhaus. This is another cover that he did and you see it's intricate it's dark it's symbolistic is uh, metaphorical is uh, is under the sign of the moon i would say so you know it, it's a different sensibility and different aesthetics but uh, very rich and uh, worthy of uh, contemplation this is the back of one of the books that he designed now you see this kind of uh, figurative uh, graphic art is uh, in, 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 in true opposition to what the Stiel and, and the Bauhaus stood for. And they were contemporary. But uh, somehow I, I have a feeling there is a lot of relevance of this work for our time. Now, some buildings from 1924 uh, to 1929, 19... Uh, um, well, 1930, uh, published in these books, these books that, uh, that he contributed to the covers with the designs. Uh, the quality of the picture is, is not great. This is an early work anyway, 1924, 1924, 25, some projects. <clears throat> these are um, actually, they, they have been unknown to me. Um, they were published in those books, but I don't know if these uh, buildings still exist. It's possible they have, have been destroyed by the war, the Second World War. Some drawings. Uh, he, you know, he drew in a so-called traditional way, you know, Bozar. He drew quite well. You will see other, other drawings by him. 
Now we'll go through some, uh, some of his buildings in Amsterdam. We start with uh, the, uh, this district, uh, Amsterdam West. He also worked, he didn't work alone. He, well, sometimes he worked alone. Other times he worked, worked in, in a group uh, with other interesting architects, among them uh, Pete Kramer. Uh, and you'll see a remarkable building built by um, Michel de Klerk and, and Pete Kramer. So these are working class socialist housing consisting of three groups of building in three different areas. I mean, they are in the same area, but they are grouped in three distinct uh, uh, groupings. Interesting also this fact that, you know, uh, you know, there, there were socialist uh, housing complexes, um, you know, working class for, for, for poor people, but, but they are remarkable and you, I like this very much that uh, the very talented architects offer their talents. Uh, they they contribute it with uh, with the architectures for those uh, uh, less privileged, and you'll see what architecture not uh, not banal at all. This is a uh, fragment of one of these uh, areas. With um, you'll see actually in the message I sent uh, there was a picture of this corner of this. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, grouping of, 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 of buildings. I, I have seen some of these buildings in when I visited Amsterdam some years ago. I, I, I searched for them and I'm happy I did. But we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of them in more detail. Now look at this rendering by uh, Michael de Klerk. You know, uh, it's, it's, I think, uh, excellent. It's, it's not, uh, you know, in the, on the vast uh, plains of the United States, the rendering doesn't have, it's an urban European context, but uh, the quality of the drafting uh, is, is, is uh, to be noticed. I mentioned the plains of the United States because somehow I keep thinking of the drawings of, of Frank Lloyd Wright, the pencil drawings, and look at the, look at the buildings. You know, they are, you know, buildings for the working class uh, people, uh, you know, but, but it's architecture with a capital A. Look at the entrance, look at the mask above the entrance, you know, which um, uh, singularizes uh, the entrance and uh, has, uh, has character and even mystery. And, uh, you know, again, this is social housing. Uh, you see at the bottom, you know, uh, architect uh, Michel de Klerk. Look at one detail, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, the craftsmanship of, of, of the bricks, working with the bricks is remarkable. And you'll see other, other details. They, they, they worked with, um, with a very, very skilled uh, uh, craftsmen. And uh, they were able, even for buildings that were not expensive, uh, they were able to, to achieve uh, high quality. I mean, who do this kind of, uh, you know, ornate, uh, you know, uh, decorative work with bricks today? You know, I don't think for social housing now. And look at the windows, you know, you have these capricious little windows. I, I call them capricious because, you know, they, they, they are dictated by mainly by um, aesthetical reasons. And, you know, just on, just here you have these two windows, then you have these, then you have these. So, you know, there is richness, there is architecture here. And, uh, you know, this, this is just a fragment. You'll see other buildings. Um, yeah, you may look at this corner here. You know, it's an event, it's an architectural event. And again, this is a building uh, done for uh, the, the least uh, privileged in society at that time. Another rendering by him. Uh, he also worked for various competitions. Um, so, you know, he was young. He died at 39. And, uh, and you know, he produced all this body of work. Um, so uh, I think uh, he is truly, he was a, a remarkable architect. And the, although he was the youngest, in the group called the School of Amsterdam, uh, he was probably the most talented and, and the most creative. I mean, you know, just compare this building to this one here. 
you know, uh, he, this has integ integrity, it has force, it has, uh, it has everything. And, uh, you know, that's the difference. This is the building. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, such architects should be known very well. You know, the students should know this architecture and these architects is, 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 is a plus if they do. I don't know how they afford it, you know, these the, this kind of, you know, details, you know, for a building that I'm sure was not expensive. It couldn't be expensive. And, and, and yet, you know, there is a lot of care, a lot of character, a lot of detailing, you know, even here, you know, we have two different kinds of windows and, you know, the brickwork, this is one ceramic, uh, Tile, this, these are bricks. And I mean, you know, there is complexity. There is some, there is some richness here. And, 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 you know, that, that entrance into the building is uh, uh, not spectacular, but it's, it doesn't leave you indifferent. Uh, this, this was built and um, I understood, uh, actually we had a chance to have here on Zoom a few months ago, the vice mayor of Hague in the Netherlands, for some reason he was attracted by, I don't know how he got the messages from me, but he was here and he told us that this is actually a museum uh, now, a museum of architecture, I think, this building, you uh, will see it. In fact, I already showed a, a picture of it uh, taken from here in one of my messages about uh, Michel de Klerk. Okay, so you see it here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, if you build this, just this building today, just this building, you'd say I'm accomplished. I did something and it would probably be published in all the magazines and so on, but he did many others. And he still is considered that he didn't build too much. <laughs> well, you know, for someone a 39 and, and the look at the quality of the architecture. Look at these windows here, you know, the variety. You have this window, you have these, you know, then you have this cylindrical tower and you have these. And I, I, I don't know, there is uh, joie de vivre in, in, in his architecture. Why did he die? Look, look, look at this, you know, look at these waves in bricks. You know, there is so much creativity here and, and skill, you know. Uh, and this is just a fragment of a, of a building that was not destined to kings and queens. And still, it's eventful, it's an ev eventful architecture. Bravo to him. Um, I mean, I am surprised actually that the School of Amsterdam is not so much not so much talked about. In fact, from what I know in the school I'm associated with, nobody talks about it as if it doesn't exist. Uh, anyway, this is also by him and we'll, we'll see, it's a very interesting uh, um, complex of buildings. Also, you know, socialist housing for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, working class people. But look what he did, you know. Uh, 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 you know, it has character. In fact, it is unique in the history of architecture, you know, with the 20th century architecture. It's fantastic. It's romantic. It's uh, almost, uh, I don't know, uh, with elements of surreality. But uh, that's because Michel de Klerk had a lot of imagination and the skill to defend it. This is the, you know, the, the rendering is perfect. You know, I mean, you look at the building, the built building, and this is the rendering, and it was not done with rabbit. You know, it was done manually. And, you know, it's discreet, it's not, uh, you know, commercially seductive, it's serious, it's sensitive. It's a very fine drawing, I would say. And, um, yeah, um, so, Happy birthday, Michel de Klerk. This is another building. I mean, just, just look at this corner, you know. 
I mean, are our buildings today much better or better? I doubt it, actually. You know, uh, you know, uh, th th there is something here on each floor to, to, to remark. It's not maybe, I mean, again, this is social housing, but, but it's social housing which says yes to life with joy, not with uh, indifference. If you could indeed say yes to life with indifference. Uh, of course, not everybody has the luxury to have a room here in the corner with that uh, special window, but some people do, and the corner is the corner, and uh, he treats it as such. Amsterdam South. So we saw Amsterdam West, and now we see Amsterdam South, another grouping of buildings called the, the Dome, the Daggard, uh, Working Class Socialist Housing by Michael de Klerk and Pete Kramer. I also have, I, I, I could uh, search for it I, if you want. I, I have a presentation just on Pete Kramer because I did pay homage to him uh, some months ago. Anyway, so, you know, the site plan is maybe not very spectacular, but you'll see the buildings. Uh, they, they are, some of them, them are very eventful. Like, for example, this, you know, again, a creation, you know, uh, how many uh, blocks of flats in the world are like this? Not too many. Well, they are here in Amsterdam, uh, built by uh, Michel de Klerk and Pete Kramer. Pete Kramer, who later in his life, he built a lot of bridges in Amsterdam. Uh, he became the, the architect of the bridges. So if you go to Amsterdam when the pandem pandemic goes away, uh, it's very possible that every time you, you cross a canal is on a bridge by Pete Kramer. Uh, but this, this housing complex is and it's so different from the previous one that we saw. Now, they built all these buildings. This one is uh, the one I prefer from this um, uh, particular grouping of, of, of buildings. It's, it's very interesting, this corner that they realize here is medieval, is, is powerful, is mysterious. I don't know what function uh, houses, maybe, you know, circulation, the vert vertical circulation, but is uh, a remarkable building. But even these on the side more modest, Again, this is uh, social housing, and and they have a they have a connection with what we call the past. I mean the traditions of uh, the, the Dutch traditions, you know the windows. But uh, literally, if we compare these windows with a, or the horizontal banal window of Le Corbusier, is the second one better? I, I don't know. I mean, with all the admiration for, for, for Le Corbusier, I don't think it is better. Here we have, yes, if you put them one near the other, you could have a, a you know, kind of a horizontal uh, window, but a window made from small fragments connects with a certain past when there were no large pieces of glass, uh, you know, uh, at, uh, at the, the builder's, um, you know, uh, discretion to use. I don't know. I, it happens that I like these kind of windows. Um, you know, a more uh, fragmented window, but uh, I think more sensitive. And here you have, you see these small asymmetries. He could have, he could have had uh, the same thing on both sides. No, he doesn't. And even the windows are different. So he creates. Uh, a small architectural event just at this entrance, just in this part of the building, you know. And this shows again, uh, I think, a skill. A look at these uh, these uh, balconies, you know, and and you not know, just the balconies, but the way they are connected vertically through these uh, uh, little parts, you know, small parts within the room that are curved, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean. You know, this requires work, detailing, and a lot of imagination. And he did it. Uh, it was built. Okay, now we go to uh, the second presentation about Michel de Klerk and the School of Amsterdam. I will show 
some works uh, also that he did together with Pete Kramer. And maybe uh, if you have a, little, a minute or two, I might search for the presentation just on Pete Kramer. Uh, let me see how this goes. So the slideshow from the beginning, <clears throat> the School of Amsterdam. So the School of Amsterdam is considered that ar architectural movement that uh, was parallel to the steel. And, uh, you know, uh, the steel didn't, was not active in Amsterdam. The School of Amsterdam was active in Amsterdam. So Amsterdam, as opposed to other cities, is the city, the, the repository of, of, of the past, in a way. And this is, uh, you know, in a way, the, the competition, for example, between Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Rotterdam is considered the city of the future, and Amsterdam is the city that, um, you know, carries on uh, with, with, with tradition. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have modern buildings as well, Amsterdam. On the other hand, Amsterdam was not destroyed by the war as Rotterdam was. Uh, the Schroeder House by, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, I'm beginning to have problems with so many names and uh, maybe uh, there are other reasons. Uh, you know- The, the Kurt Vonnegut. House. Pardon? Kurt Vonnegut. Riedveld. Well, Riedveld, Riedveld uh, uh, was active in Hague. So the Schroeder House is in Hague, not in Rotterdam. But the, the, you know, the, the dichotomy or the, 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 the competition is between uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Anyway, we are now in Amsterdam and we see again some pictures that you already saw. This is, uh, you didn't see this one. This is how he looked uh, in his 30s. Um, you know, a handsome man, but, but he died at 39. We saw already this building. I don't know if exactly this picture, maybe exactly this picture. We saw this from a different angle. Uh, and um, yeah, this was his work. He didn't work here with Pete Kramer or others from the group of, uh, of, um, of the School of Amsterdam. We saw this one. And uh, now uh, we saw this one, yes. And uh, but 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 you see here, why did he do something like this? You know, uh, well, why not? You know, why should we let reason triumph always? You know, we, we there is room, I think, even for uh, small gestures of uh, capriciousness, if that so-called capriciousness is is led by. Uh, you know, emotions and a certain sensitivity is fine. You know, he modulates this uh, facade uh, in, a, in a way that goes beyond uh, a dry rationalism. Another, um, I think this was a competition entry but I think the drawing is uh, impeccable. You know, uh, uh, I think this architect had great potential. Uh, you know, it's so sad he died young. Uh, because he is not just the window that is sometimes an event, but even the doors, you see, and the, the, the framing around the door. Uh, Everything is interconnected and it has a level of uh, elaboration and, uh, you know, craft. You know, look here. You know, uh, these things are important, but we don't do such things any longer because we, we lost that, that need and that desire for, for ornament or for uh, a certain complexity of work with bricks or otherwise. Uh, something was lost. Um, Anyway, uh, look here, you know, uh, how, how interestingly, and it's almost a witticism in a way, the way he ends, you know, this, this, this particular uh, segment of, of the housing complex, you know, just, uh, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, I mean, if you try to find equivalence in literature or in the art of writing, you'd say, you know, the way you end the phrase 
is important and you don't end it you know without some kind of uh, you know mysterious uh, you know so it, it, it's ended but it's also open ended it's it, it because of the imagination that is employed and the imagination it is uh, uh, addressing at the same time you know it i hope i I, 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 I mean, I try to, to, to improvise some kind of uh, description of why, why I'm, 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 I'm seduced by such uh, architecture and here as well, you know. Uh, I imagine he lived uh, to his 90s, you know, I, I mean, you know, he could have produced a lot of architecture. Unfortunately, fate decided to take him away at 39. Uh, this is another building, but is, uh, you know, it, all buildings have something in common, but they are also, you know, slightly different. You know, some people might say, well, these are not very innovative, you know, they are rather, no, it's not true at all. I mean, you know, in fact, if you compare, you know, blocks of flats, so-called modern, exclusively modern, with these, these are much more creative. I mean, they use sloping roofs, but uh, there is more to it, you know, look at those maybe chimneys, you know, in between and they are sculptural and I don't know, they have rhythm, rhythm, they are not in different buildings. And still they have a social value because they are, you know, social housing. So it's not just a, an empty aestheticism, you know, devoid of social concerns, no. Look at this, uh, you know, intervention, sculptural intervention with, with bricks. You know, I mean, this is in the best medieval tradition. Who knows? I mean, I don't know if he planned this, you know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But, but the workers, they also enjoy themselves when they created this wall. It wasn't just, you know, a banal functional wall made of bricks. It also included art. And in this case, is this artwork in bricks that is part of the building, you know, and it's important, you know, uh, once you see it, it's hard to forget it. You remember a building there in Amsterdam has this thing and it's the only one he, he, it had something like this. Very nice. Now you see this building by Piet Kramer and Michael de Klerk or Michael de Klerk and Piet Kramer. Piet Kramer was a little bit older than, than, uh, than uh, Michael de Klerk. And here again, you know, we have uh, the architect uh, not saying no to, um, you know, sculpture or sculptural, uh, you know, elements in, 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 in the art of building. If they would have done just this, would have been fine, but they also did this, you know, and, you know, this is important, you know, why should we always end the buildings in a, you know, predictable way? Why not create? Because yes, this is the end, the corner of the building. This is the corner of the building. It should be a little bit different than, you know, what is happening in the center or, uh, you know, the corners of other buildings. Here also, you know, you have this intermediate interstitial space between the, this monumental corner and the two aisles. And uh, I don't know, I, I mean, I'm trying to explain analytically something that has to do with emotions, with uh, look at that sculpture there, you know. And again, these are social housings. You know, we could say, well, we don't have money for sculptures any longer. Come on, there are art starving artists who would love to work even for free to have the chance to add a sculpture to a certain part of the building. Why don't we employ them? Uh, 
uh, why don't we collaborate with them? You know, I'm sure they would, it would be very happy. Anyway, now we see this park. Uh, I don't think Mikel de Klerk built anything in this park, but it's, it's, there are some remarkable buildings here. Uh, from, unfortunately, some have been destroyed. Um, so initially they built, this was a very special situation. Uh, someone, uh, an enlightened man uh, bought uh, this uh, piece of land and invited very young architects to build uh, some experimental buildings. And this is what we are going to see. And look at them, you know, they are all uh, imbued with, uh, with uh, you know, a certain formalism, but this formalism refers to, I don't know, to African masks, to they, they are a little bit mysterious and exotic. And uh, at, at the same time, there is a clarity of vision. It's not, you don't really see here confusion. But they are interesting. There is a certain idealism which has to do with emotion, with expressivity. That's why it is considered an expressionist uh, movement. But an expressionist movement within a country which is notoriously pragmatic. You know, the Dutch are considered pragmatic, but on the other hand, they have an unbelievable uh, richness in the field of art and architecture, unbelievable uh, artists and architects, as you know. I mean, it, it's just amazing that this country that is considered that, you know, the Dutch are pragmatic people. Well, they might be pragmatic, but, you know, they gave to the world Vincent van Gogh. They gave to the world Rembrandt. They gave to the world unbelievable. I mean, you know, uh, Piet Mondrian. You know, Rubens, well, Rubens was rather Flemish, but they were, you know, there together. And Peter Bruegel and Jesus, you know, what architects, even today, it's actually amazing, you know, when you think about it. What is it about the Dutch that they are so creative and so unconventional and they experiment continuously, you know? They did at the beginning of the 20th century and they still do it. You know, they, it's almost like a, an engine of, of experimentation in Europe. Um, anyway, um, and you can see at the same time, they had Theo van Dersburg and the Stiel, and they also had the School of Amsterdam at the very same time. I mean, look, look what buildings they did just in this park. You know, that... Uh, I mean, this is a little shed. I don't know what its what its function is. I hope I have other pictures with it because it's very interesting and it's really a very it's a shack. It's a very small building, this one, but it's delicious if I can use such a word. I mean, it is delicious, you know, with the way it is covered with, and it's a, you could even say it's sustainable. And look here, you know, look at this. Uh, eventful ending here. Everything is fine and it's mysterious. I, I don't know what it is, but it's perfect in its own way. It's both rational and irrational. It's also surreal. And, you know, let us not forget from approximately the same land is Hieronymus Bosch, another fantastic, fantastic artist. God, you know, how come, you know, they, they had and have these artists there. Um, and uh, to, the, to this year, for example, is the centennial of, uh, of Constant, the, the, the very important artist who also created the new Babylon architectural series that, that is still stirring up the imagination of our architects worldwide and so on. Um, anyway. I, I like this architecture. Now some architectural details, so-called details. Well, you know, it was said architecture doesn't have details, meaning that every part of the building is connected with the other part. So, you know, everything counts. Uh, unfortunately, some of these pictures, as I said, uh, this presentation deserves to be um, amplified. And I apologize, but it's a small introduction to the School of Amsterdam and to Michel de Klerk. I mean, you look at this window here, you know, 
it really has character, you know, uh, it, it has something to say, it, it, it says something. And uh, it's whimsical, yes. What made the architect and the architects to do this? I don't know, it's invention, the, the attraction towards invention, towards doing, uh, you know, uh, unexpected things. Uh, look at this. Of course, there is work here. Yes, you need a good craftsman. You need to manufacture those bricks, you know, in a certain way. You have to work carefully. But, but this, this amplifies your pride in the act of erecting the building. I think it's important. I think John Ruskin was right. In the Middle Ages, the builder was, was, was invested with the responsibility and with the freedom to spontaneously, you know, participate creatively to the, you know, let's say to the building of the cathedral. And this, this is important because the worker doesn't become just a laborer, a slave who places uh, predictably and in a boring way, a brick above another brick. No, uh, the, the worker participates creatively to the construction of a building that has parts that are not just uh, repetition and uh, standardization. And that's why it is important because we think, you know, of the architect, you know, that the architect is the creator. No, the, 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 also the builder should have, you know, the, the builder shouldn't just mechanically you know, uh, translate in three dimension what the architect gave him in two dimensions. No, it, I don't know. I, maybe I, my, my conception about the art of building is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, romantic, but that's how you erect such buildings. And, you know, they, they did a beautiful job. Uh, I mean, look here, you know, look at this entrance. But I'm sure the, the workers who, who erected these buildings arrived at pride in the good sense of the word. You know, because it was also about beauty and character. You know, it's not just a hole in the wall here. It's, it, it's an interest for some human beings who, you know, like to differentiate themselves from, uh, they don't always succeed, but I like to think that they like to think that they are different from, you know, animals or robots. Anyway, look at these windows. Look how, you know, you have this window, you have this one, and you have this one just in this uh, fragment. And then you have this, you know, just in, you know, how many square meters do you have here, you know? And I don't know, eight by six or something. And you have already, each, each window is different. I mean, you have these two and these three, two, but, there are three types of wi uh, windows and with the one on the door, four. Uh, uh, look at the bricks, how they are, they are, they are placed here. You know, it's not uh, the same way because it's above the, the door. So I don't know. And very discreet as well. And, and look at this, you know, I mean, this is architecture. I can call it, I cannot call it in any other way. It is architecture right here. You know, and this is a social housing, but someone thought, someone felt, you know, it's important. An entrance into a building is important. It cannot be just a hole in the wall unless you are cynically inclined. Now, what is this? Well, maybe there is a lamp here or something, but it becomes also a sculpture. It's a sculptural element. Nice. Uh, uh, look at this uh, block of flats, a little building, but, uh, you know, it, it has character. It is interesting. Look at this, the windows here and the corner and everything is, they, they, they were tempted towards uh, a musical work, so to speak. So that's, that's, I mean, I keep repeating this and I will say it again. I think Paul Valéry, the great uh, French poet was right. There are three kinds of builders. The one who puts a brick above another brick, that's a builder. Then you have one who places a brick above another brick and makes them talk. He's a master builder. And then the third one who puts a brick above another brick and makes them sing. And his name is Eupalinos 
ularchitect or the architect. I think we should all strive to be upalinos like to make the bricks and the stones and so on on sink, if this doesn't sound too naive or uh, anachronistic these days. Look again, even here, you know, these, these, these details, you know, that, which are architectural events. That's what they are. And bravo to him and to them, to, to, the, to the builders, to the workers, you know. I love bricks in general, and, and they are, they show respect and love, affection for bricks. I mean, you know, just here, they, why did they complicate themselves with this thing here? Well, because again, you know, architecture is not just about efficiency and standardization and finishing the job as quickly as possible to live and watch TV or, you know, uh, as much as possible. No, it's about building buildings that we are proud of. look at this window you know not only that it is a special window but it is at a certain angle from the surface of the wall uh, as it should be this one as well it's a creation that's what it is you don't buy it from uh, you know home depot or something you, you create it and this one as well and yes, um, <laughs> I mean, look here, you know, who would do something like this today? Very few people, if any, they did it. Um, and here there is narration. If you stop for a second or a minute and look, maybe you imagine certain things, you see a human figure here, you see maybe, you know, uh, someone with an arch and then uh, the bow and, uh, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it, uh, that, yeah, there are so references to mythology, you have to know that mythology, and we don't, and I don't, and I, I don't know, we live in a different world. I, 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 what do you make of these two windows, you know? The functionalist would say, come on, this is sheer nonsense. You have uh, probably just one room behind these two windows, which seem to go towards each other, and then they turn their backs on, on, on each other. And then still they look towards each other. Because you, it's almost far for, uh, you know, for someone with bipolar personality. I, I listened today on the radio, and they said that in France, many people suffer from bipolar personality. So here you have someone with a split personality, you know, because when you are inside the room, I'm sure this is a room from here to here. And you have this split facade with two windows. And, you know, if you want to look outside from this window, you see in that di direction, from here you see in that direction, and from here you see still in a different direction because diagonally kind of. And, and if you split yourself in two, of course, sorry, now I, I, am, I am maybe going too far. But if, if I split myself in two and one half of me will be here and the other half of me will be here, I can see myself, you know, from one window in the other. Something like this. Anyway, it's very interesting. You know, I, I never saw another window like this in, in all the books of, with architecture that I looked at and everything I visited is just here in Amsterdam. And I think it's very interesting. The rift, the schism, the schismatic uh, uh, windows. Okay, so this was the presentation about the School of Amsterdam and Michael de Klerk, and I, 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 I apologize again, they, they deserve more, but uh, we still uh, had an introduction, and now I go to Walter Burley Griffin, whose birthday is also today, uh, was today in 1876. Uh, and uh, let's talk a little bit about him and, and, and the work he did uh, with his wife, um, Marion, who was a very interesting, uh, talented uh, woman architect. I don't know, she was either the first one or the second one American female architect who graduated from MIT, uh, which was not a little thing, you know, uh, more than 100 years ago. 
and she was uh, uh, I read in some some writings that um, you know she was the the most talented uh, drafts person in uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's office. Griffin also worked in Frank Lloyd Wright's office, and he even uh, you know was in charge with some projects, and uh, even more so when Frank Lloyd Wright was in Japan. From what I read, Frank Lloyd Wright, who always often had troubles with money, uh, he borrowed money from Griffin and went to Japan. And when he returned, he paid Griffin not with money, but with he paid back Griffin not with money, but with the Japanese woodcuts. Then they had a conflict because Griffin took the liberty to, you know, implement some changes in his design. In the meantime, when when Frank Lloyd Wright was in in Japan, and uh, so of course Frank Lloyd Wright didn't like that, and you know they said goodbye to each other. Uh, but he worked for a number of years for uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and so did his wife, uh, Marion. Um, now this is him; it's not Marion. <laughs> Although initially, you know, I, I almost felt the, like uh, seeing a, a woman here, not a man. But it's him, Walter Gorley uh, Griffin. Here they are <clears throat> together. They don't seem very happy. What happened? I I I, I don't know very well in detail. What happened? They won the competition for the capital of Canberra, uh, of Australia, and they moved to Australia in order to build, um, uh, you know, the capital. But they encountered some difficulties. I don't know exactly why. They they encountered some difficulties there. Their plan was not uh, executed uh, uh, as 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 they intended. They built buildings in, in, in Australia, but then they returned to the United States. We'll see some buildings that they built in Australia, in Melbourne and, and near Sydney, but also uh, at least one building they built in, um, in the United States, uh, a villa, a house in, in Evanston. So you see, there are you know, books published about them, Grand Obsessions, The Life and Work of Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Mahoney Griffin, his wife, uh, two excellent architects. So he was an American architect and landscape architect. He even studied horticulture uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in school, which is, uh, I think we need more of it today. He's noted for designing Canberra, Australia's capital city, and Griffith, New South Wales. He has been credited with the development of the L-shaped floor plan, the carport, and the innovative use of reinforced concrete. Now, I don't know if he <laughs> truly invented the, the L-shaped floor plan, but this is what it's, it is said here. Influenced by the Chicago-based Prairie School, Griffin developed a unique modern style. He worked in partnership with his wife, Marion Mahoney Griffin. In 28 years, they designed over 350 buildings. <clears throat> I don't know, the, the number seems to me high, but I don't know, maybe. Uh, they were trying to compete with Frank Lloyd Wright, who designed about 1,000 landscape and urban design projects, as well as designing construction materials. How could you design construction material? Well, I, I don't know. Anyway, interiors, furniture, and other household items. Canberra. Canberra, where I just show this site plan. So they won the competition for the, uh, you know, the, the capital of, of the capital of Australia that for some reason was not built. Uh, and I think uh, it was uh, uh, Romardo Gurgola Gur who, who built who built it, but not the Griffith, Griffiths. And, uh, but I like this drawing and it shows that this man not only was an architect and knew about buildings, but he also knew about landscape design. It's, a, it's a, an intricate, uh, almost visceral landscape design here. And I imagine they proposed to design everything here, the buildings and so on. For, for some reason, it didn't happen. Um, but they designed some buildings, and I begin maybe with the ending. In, in a strange way, he built, I don't know, six, seven incinerators in Australia, and they are very, if you can say, if you can call an incinerator a very nice uh, 
architecture, what they are. Um, so it is this incinerator in uh, Ipswich, uh, in Queensland, you know, uh, you say this is a temple or a church. Well, you know, it is, it is about the afterlife. It is about um, incinerating the dead. And there is dignity here. And there is maybe even a certain symbolism. And I think it's a fine architecture. Uh, you know, maybe one day we'll make a presentation about incinerators of the world, although it may sound a little strange. The Newman College will see other um, incinerators. This is a, a, a college uh, that is remarkable. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, this man built a few buildings in the prairie style, you know, that was um, advocated and brilliantly um, externalized by Frank Lloyd Wright. But here is a different architecture, you know, he uses stone and there are some Gothic references and probably appropriately because, you know, Australia was colonized by the, by the British. And, uh, you know, there in the 19th century, there was uh, the Neo-Gothic, uh, you know, um, very, very uh, used and appreciated. And now in Australia, we have, you know, Griffin is considered the genius. Some people think now, of course, the, you know, the evaluations are, you know, only, I don't know, but, but it does seem something. He was a man who was very appreciated for his work. Yes, the interior is rather less, less surprising than one would expect, but who knows, maybe in time also, I mean, the building outside has a, is raw. I mean, it's culture, it's historical, but it's also the stone gives it a, a something that the inside is missing. But uh, who knows if, if maybe it was refurbished in this way or that's what he wanted to do, I don't know. Now you see another incinerator in the suburb of uh, Brompton, South Australia, uh, is this one. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it's not a, you know, it's not a banal building. It's not a building that says no to architecture. Although the cynic might say, come on, it's just a, you know, a, a machine that transforms the human bodies into, into ashes. But uh, it's also a meditation on the ending of life, I, I would say. So it's, it's a building that uh, refuses to reduce the human life to sheer prose. Another incinerator from this uh, place, this town in, in South Australia, he built six or seven. And uh, I don't know, they, uh, when you think that Frank Lloyd Wright always plays for his domestic architecture at the center fire, here we also have fire, but this is not about domestic architecture or about nourishing life with that fire, but actually, but actually ending life with fire. So maybe an essay could be written or even a book published about fire for Frank Lloyd Wright and fire for Walter um, uh, Burley uh, Griffin. I like this very much. This uh, fragment is the, the Roman Catholic uh, college that he built also in Australia. He worked with stone, I think, quite, uh, uh, quite convincingly. And uh, yeah, uh, this is not an architecture that leaves you indifferent, I think, no. Walter Burley Griffin. We should remember this name. He was different from Frank Lloyd Wright. He was not just a follower of Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, he, he had his own personality and his own vision. This is a rendering, I don't know, he did it or his wife did it, they did it, and it's, it's a fine drawing. I know Frank Lloyd Wright appreciated his wife, Marion Mahoney Griffin, very much. But even if he appreciated her very much, and he also appreciated uh, uh, Walter very much, but there was no prospect at all, as, as Walter imagined, that he would become a partner 
in the in the office of uh, or the practice of Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright wouldn't uh, have partners, that's for sure. Anyway, but uh, on their own path, I did. They, I think, they did uh, some some excellent works. And they were not, uh, you know, uh, epigons. You know, they they had their own personality. Now I only have one picture of this cafe Australia. Uh, I kept discovering some buildings. That's why I said, and I apologize again. The presentation deserves uh, amplification and uh, and more uh, organization and uh, uh, rigor. But uh, maybe. Uh, if I will have another occasion next year, I will I will do so. This is another. Uh, this is not a cafe Australia. I think this is another. Although I don't know what is going on there. I think this is. Is it another? Uh, I'm a little bit confused. Is it? Uh, is it another incinerator? It might be. Yes. This is another incinerator. But look at it. You know, I think even Frank Lloyd Wright would have uploaded it. It's very interesting the relationship between Frank Lloyd Wright and his most, uh, you know, creative uh, uh, people who intersected their lives with his. For example, Bruce Goff wanted to work and study with Frank Lloyd Wright, and after a short while, he turned his back on Frank Lloyd Wright. Maybe with the same reason uh, Brunkus uh, turned his back on Rodin, on Auguste Rodin, when he told him in the shadow of the, of the big trees, grass does not grow. So Bruce Goff turns his, turned his back on, on Frank Lloyd Wright, and from that moment, Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, admired him and maybe even loved him. And uh, Bruce Goff went on to build a very important um, career in, in architecture, although he didn't study in an architecture school, but was a very interesting architect and very accomplished and built a lot. And Griffin, you know, also kind of turned his back on Frank Lloyd Wright, moved to Australia, and without copying Frank Lloyd Wright, created a body of work that is uh, original and, and interesting and meaningful. So I, I, I imagine Frank Lloyd Wright admired people like Bruce Goff and um, uh, Walter Burley uh, Griffin. Because he was the same way, <laughs> you know, kind of the black sheep, you know, the turn, you know, having conflicts with Sullivan. Uh, and, uh, and but still admired him a lot, admiring him a lot, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright didn't admire too many people, but but he admired uh, his master, Liebermeister um, Louis Sullivan, and he had all the reasons to admire him, of course. Um, so Sullivan had troubles with Wright. Wright had troubles with uh, Griffin, and with uh, maybe to an extent with Bruce Goff. The story goes on, uh, and uh, yes, creative people could be difficult, but uh, they are the ones who carry on, so to speak. Now a house in Melbourne, the Leonard house, don't expect a house with a sloping roof is actually a little skyscraper, if I can say something like this. Look at it, <laughs> you know, but it's excellent, you know, at least in, you know, the, 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 the main facade towards the street. It's it's very well articulated and rich and interesting and yet simple. Um, it stands out. I hope they didn't demolish it. Uh, sorry for the pictures, but uh, you know, just like in the case of uh, Michel de Clerc, you have sculptural elements that uh, mean something and uh, are important in the crystallization of, of the project. A good architect, what else can we say? Now, his own house, the Walter Burley Griffin House on, on Edinburgh Street, in, in this, uh, I don't know how to call it, this district or this area, Castle Crag in Australia, they built several houses. You'll see another one or two. Uh, this is this is the house and I, I like I like it, you know, it's it's 
it's rectangular, but the, the stone uh, gives it, um, you know, uh, not just solidity, but also character. And uh, it's, it, it's a fine building. Now the Fishwick House, uh, Castle Crag is at eight kilometers from Sydney. Uh, another house where this, uh, this meeting between uh, the green of the plants and the stones, the stones and the, and the plants, I think they, they love each other and they go well together. Uh, so who said that architecture is against nature? Not necessarily. I mean, would you say that, you know, the, here we have cohabitation between architecture and nature. And um, yeah, um, and this is a, uh, well, I don't know who did this. I see there are two letters, but it's neither Walter uh, Griffin nor uh, his wife. It's an illustration of the building and the view from the inside. Uh, you know, the, the, the master bedroom. I didn't have to, I didn't find too many pictures, but um, this, this is a different house, but I like it very much. So, and very, very different from the architecture of, 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 uh, of Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I really feel tempted even tonight after the presentation to continue to work on this presentation because it fascinates me what I discover, you know, uh, these architects who are a little bit less known, but they deserve to be known. Um, anyway. Uh, another house, which I imagine this is the name of the new um, um, owner, uh, Chong House. I don't know if this is not the very house where Griffin lived. It might be. Uh, sorry for this, but I, I show another drawing which is possible was done by Mahogany, by Mario Mahoney uh, Griffin, uh, his wife. The Rampart, Rampart House. Here is a, a, a you know, a hand-drawn, uh, you know, presentation drawing, and I think it's very nicely done. You know, it's simple, but it's also, uh, it has sensitivity and uh, Again, who says that uh, cynically the building is uh, against nature? To an extent, yes, there is conflict, but it's not just conflict. It's also, at best, probably nature and architecture coexist or could coexist. And in the drawings, they seem to coexist in this drawing. Now, a house in Evanston in, in the United States, uh, this was built in 1910, so earlier when they still worked in, in the so-called prairie style, uh, and um, it's, a, it's a fine building. It's, uh, you know, you could easily mistake it for a, a building by right. But now it's done by uh, by Burley Griffin, and uh, 110 years ago. Well, he he benefited often uh, of uh, building in uh, in in beautiful natural uh, surroundings. But uh, I think he did a good job. He didn't insult the trees. He didn't insult the grass. He didn't insult the plants. He didn't insult, uh, insult the sky. He was a sensitive architect who, who knew how to build. And uh, we, can, uh, we can contemplate his work further maybe uh, next year. Thank you very much.